Thank you, Yulf. Um, it's good then to see everyone in person and online. Um, let's start with the panel. Uh, thank you, Yulf, for introducing it. My name is Desiree Milosevic. I'm one of the co-chairs and we have Achilles also online with us who cannot be here in person. Um, as Yulf has been saying, we have a panel on net neutrality. So I would kindly ask all the panelists who are here in the room in person with us uh, to take their uh, chair here and come up to the floor. And also um, we have two panelists online who will be joining us, one or two, we'll, we'll figure it out. Um, so what we try to do is really have a diverse view on this uh, burning topic on network imbalances maybe and uh, we'll hear more from the esteemed panelists. Um, as they're doing introductions, um, I will just briefly say who we have here in case you didn't read our mailing list. Uh, so we have with us today Marit um, Palvorita, and she's a senior director at Etno. Um, we will also have two online panelists, uh, Frode Sorensen and Klaus um, Neiman, who are both been working as the Open Internet Working Group Chairs of the BEREC, uh, which is the regulatory agency, as you know, for um, electronic communications. And also here with us, we have Alex Diode from AMSEX. Hello. Um, our member, we um, have Thomas Loninger um, with Epic Center Works, uh, who will be speaking to us about from civil society point of view on this topic. And we have Freddie Kunzler from uh, INIT7. Uh, so with that, I'd, uh, uh, without a further ado, I would like to give the floor to Marit to see uh, whether she'd like to start first with her opening state um, statement. Thank you. Thank you, Desiree. So, um... Thank you for the introductions and thank you for the invitation to this event. Um, I am very aware that this is, of course, a technical event at large and the topic that we're discussing today is a policy topic and even worse, a political topic, which probably, um, which probably will cause some controversy and I think that's, that's welcome. And in fact, the reason why I'm also here is because we from the telco side we wanted to have an open discussion on this because there is some bad history. Um, uh, there are all kinds of preconceptions. So we would like to, you know, have this discussion this time around openly um, and also to make sure that it's fact-based um, um, from, from all sides. So I think the title of this uh, event says it all, a call for large content platforms to contribute to the cost of European digital infrastructure that carries their services. That's the uh, session um, uh, title today. And just to give a bit of background from Brussels. So I'm actually from Etno, uh, presenting the large operators, uh, 33 um, of the largest operators in Europe, um, the former incumbents, if you like. And, um, the discussion started last year. Uh, there was uh, there were some calls from operator sites on this topic, and the European Commission actually picked it up last year in a document that it's called the European Digital Principles um, uh, document. And in that, they uh, recognised that there should be some adequate frameworks um, to, to to provide for um, a contribution or fair contribution to the infrastructures, digital infrastructures in Europe. And um, this was, of course, from our point of view, first time that something has been uh, recognized in writing. And we then commissioned a report on this topic with Axon Partners. There's a couple of copies in the front. Because we wanted to really have a, let's say, an explanation on what is the problem from our side? Where is the issue? What is the challenge for telecom operators? Also look at the bigger picture. What are the socioeconomic impacts on this current situation on the European citizen on innovation on the green factor which is very relevant today and and then finally look at uh, lightly some policy solutions so 
The report was launched a couple of weeks ago and we've had a huge reaction to this um, uh, from the highest political level to, of course, uh, to the grassroots level from all sides. And what is the report about then? So, as I said, so we wanted to contribute to this discussion that the European Commission in a way uh, opened. And it's really then to try and highlight on where are we today? So. If I just give you some numbers, so the European telcos uh, have invested some 500 billion uh, euros on infrastructure in the last 10 years. That's a lot of money. And, you know, that's also a lot of progress, I think, for, for the European connectivity. In the same time, data traffic volumes have also increased exponentially. And according to this study, so 55% of the current data volumes actually come from six players. Um, you know, that belong to the so-called big tech or OTT, so whatever you want to call these companies. And that then uh, is challenging for operators from mainly two perspectives. So there is, of course, a cost to delivering this traffic to operators. And there seems to be um, at the IP markets level an imbalance uh, in the negotiation power at the purely commercial level of trying to come to an agreement at which terms and, 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 and so forth operators can um, or, or should deliver this traffic. Of course, we all know that in the European Union we have the net neutrality rules whereby operators are obliged to deliver all traffic to end, end users in Europe. So there's absolutely no way of um, saying, oh, we can't do that. Um, so so that's, a, that's a kind of a red line, if you like. The other thing is the asymmetry in regulatory obligations. So as I already said, open internet rules have been, they weren't actually here in 2012. They have come along since. This is, these are rules that are not, for example, in place anymore in the US. We have consumer price regulation still indirectly and directly in place in wholesale markets, uh, partially also consumer markets. And finally, we have a competition policy framework in Europe, which pretty much makes it very difficult for the telco sector to consolidate, leading to a situation where we now in Europe have about 100 operators um, in a market that is, well, in, in some places uh, not very populated. So that's the big picture, the problem, uh, if you like. Um, and then um, going to the solution, perhaps, so what are we looking at? At this stage, um, we are really wanting to understand better the imbalances in the IP traffic markets. And that seems to be the, the, the cornerstone of, of the discussion, also from our members' perspective. What is also clear, and we wanted to put it up from there uh, in our report, in this report, that anything that we do should be done by respecting the open internet rules that we have in place. And this may sound a bit light coming from the operators, but in fact, in the past few years that the regulation has been in place, this has become a kind of factor of stability for our members. So now that the practices have been established, and in fact, there are very few, let's say, violations of the rules these days in Europe, so they are very well respected. So, you know, that wouldn't be the instinct to go that way and try and change the regulatory scene that way. So the only then solution is to, as I said already, to try and address the perceived unbalance in power, in market power in the IP markets and to see a little bit on if there should be some kind of a fair contribution to the network deployment by those companies who are generating most of this traffic. So maybe I'll just leave it there. Um, just to say that, as I said, so, you know, it is a divisive issue and uh, we are here to have an open discussion. So I, of course, then welcome questions and comments from the audience. Thank you so much, uh, Marit. Um, I'm sure that uh, we will get a lot of uh, questions for you and responses. I would maybe ask Alex, since you're sitting next to her, to uh, give your perspective from M6 and from operators point of yep. view. Um, Thank you. Um, I've been working in the Brussels arena for the last, I think, 10 years. Um, and when I started, this also was a discussion. So basically, we're redoing the discussion that happened 10 years ago. I think in one of the coming presentations, uh, there will be an outlay of what the history was. Um, sufficient for me to say that in the end, Commissioner Cruz uh, said, that the reason people pay for internet connectivity is these big um, platforms. 
So they provide a service where the uh, telcos basically can sell the internet connectivity for. One of the questions uh, you then of course have is why are they redoing this discussion now? If you remember, there was a discussion a couple of years ago about Google and Facebook publishing news articles. Um, the publishers wanted to have a slice of money from that. Um, they lobbied in Brussels and successfully, and Google and Facebook now have to pay uh, publishers for news snippets. Um, I think you have to see this, this ethno uh, action in the same light. Uh, for Brussels, big American technology companies are bad. European companies are okay. Um, so if you want to get some extra money um, as a European entity, it's very easy uh, to stir um, the anti-American sentiment in the Brussels uh, policy arena. And I think that's what, uh, what Ethno is doing. Um, one of the, the tenants, I think, of, of the internet we have now is that everybody pays his own cost. So you have a network, uh, you pay for your cost. Already, you have to pay extra if you want to connect to the eyeballs. Uh, you can get very cheap uh, transit for 10, 6, whatever uh, cents per Mbit. But if you want to, want to reach one of the, the bigger telcos, uh, you have to pay 40, 50 cents, which already is four or five times what you pay for, uh, for normal internet. So they already have toll gates available. Um, they're not on the uh, main IXPs anymore because then you have to exchange traffic for free. Uh, you can't use your toll gate. Um, so in effect, they're having um, their customers pay for the internet connectivity. Um, they upgrade it every once in a while. So you pay a, a, a huge amount relatively for the usage. And now they're saying, ah, people are making use of uh, a lot of these American platforms. Apparently, they generate 60% of our traffic. Uh, so let's see if we can get some extra money. Um, I don't think that's the right way to do business, uh, but we can have the discussion uh, later on. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing your uh, views with us, Alex. I, I think before going online, I would just um, ask um, Thomas to maybe react to this uh, business perspective. If he, as a user, has a point of view of how would this possible change affect internet user. Thank you, Desiree, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very, very happy to be here at RIPE and also here in a room with you all. Um, it was mentioned before that this idea that we are discussing today is actually very old. It is as old as the telephony network because the termination fees that we know there are basically what Etna is proposing. And this idea that uh, keeping a customer reachable and therefore uh, deserving money from whoever wants to communicate with them is the core of this idea. It was called calling party network pace and this time around it is called sending party pace or sending party network pace. And it was discussed at length 10 years ago at the ITU level and rejected almost unanimously. The OECD thought it to be unworkable. Barrack, the body of telecom regulators in Europe, um, rejected it outright since commission studies on interconnection, several of them, they all came to the same conclusion and those guys have access to the full picture of the market because they are regulators, they are allowed to look deep into things. I'm not even mentioning the case by case assessment that we've seen in France, in Germany, and all of these independent actors came to the conclusion, no, there actually is no problem. And the whole basis under which this proposal comes to us um, is, is um, yeah, based on a flawed understanding of how the internet works. If you go to the statements of Commissioner Bestager and Commissioner Breton, they are talking about the traffic being produced in the network by these big tech companies from the US. So they are just, have not understand that uh, this traffic is requested by paying customers. Um, and this is thankfully how the internet works. Um, and you can assess here also that we are talking about a fundamental shift. We have seen only one country in the world where this has succeeded, it's South Korea. They have a sending party pays system. And the consequences there, um, I would invite you to scrutinize them. If Europe were to follow this model, that would be it for the global interconnection market. 
because the subsidiaries and the market power and the global standard setting function that Europe has would lead to a global change in the way we connect the internet together. And Edna talks in its study about an obligation for OTTs to negotiate direct agreements with the telecom companies. One has to ask, what else? Like when I have to negotiate an agreement, what happens if I don't reach an agreement? Because these right now are secret business deals. Most of them are not even open. So what happens with the transit? What happens with all of the other connections that are not part of this paid peering agreement? And I come back here to the declaration that Etno is uh, basing its lobby attack on, the declaration about the digital decade. There it also says we commit to protecting net neutrality and the open internet. And content services and applications should not unjustifiably be blocked or degraded. Um, and again, coming from someone like me who has been working for net, on net neutrality for over a decade, um, it's great to hear the telecom industry talking about stability in the market. Um, we've been fighting against zero rating for many, many years. And it was just last year that the European High Court sided with us and said, no, zero rating is illegal. And now in all but two European countries, we have to scrap the zero rating products because they are everywhere. And we've conducted a study in 2019 and looked at the applications that are zero rated. Um, from the top 20, only four are you from Europe. All the others are Americans. So the telecom industry cannot, via zero rating, incentivize the traffic from the big American corporations. And basically, they've given it for free. It was not even deducted from the monthly data cap. And at the same time say, oh, but they are flooding our networks and now we want money for it. Um, there is a net neutrality law in Europe, thankfully. The telecom single market regulation has a clear obligation. The telecom companies have to connect to all endpoints of the internet, that they have to treat all traffic equally, technically and commercially, and they are not allowed to change the price of the products based on the applications that are used. So for me, it is clear, if Edna wants to succeed with this, they have to scrap net neutrality from the books. We have to reopen telecom single market. We have to basically and there's only one historical example from the Donald Trump administration, completely destroy net neutrality protections in Europe for the ethnic proposal to be remotely legal. And lastly, I want to use this opportunity um, to invite you all to join the debate. This has been going on, as we've heard, since last year. And believe it or not, this is the first public debate that we had about this. We've tried to come into the closed door lobby meetings that have happened in Brussels so far without success. Civil society was not on the table and you as a technical community that will have to live in this new regulatory framework were also not on the table. So I would welcome you all to join the debate to help us make the case for the open internet and to hopefully prevent this ethnic proposal from becoming a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas, uh, for um, your views on that. Uh, we'll go further um, and back to Freddy Kunzler from INIT7, who has prepared a short set of slides. Um, so if we can just have them online, um, you have your own opening statement. Um, you can probably do, say, next slide. Okay, uh, I say next slide. So um, uh, thanks for the invitation to this uh, roundtable. My name is Freddy Künstler. I uh, tried to shorten the long title uh, that it fits my slide. So Govom to pay for FTTH. This is the goal, basically. Um, <clears throat> thank you. I, I, I don't know. It doesn't work. Maybe I'm too stupid to press the right button. Green yeah. is forward, top one. Oh, now, so short word about init seven. Um, this, uh, oops, now I want back. This is me. Um, I'm a CEO and founder and network engineer at init seven. 
Uh, Init7 is an independent uh, broadband provider in Switzerland. We do uh, gigabit FTTH since 2014. We recently launched 25 gigabit FTTH because it's cool, same price, includes TV. Um, and uh, we aim to provide a broadband service which is not broken unlike many others and uh, if you're interested in what we do uh, see the the archive of uh, my colleague pascal glor our cto he presented yesterday in the connect working group uh, we also won some uh, awards and uh, now to the topic of um, to pay for ftth so here i had a, sl a slide in between it said just no um, because broadband customers, they are causing the traffic and not content. And this is the big misconception of uh, Marit we had before. Uh, content is not producing traffic. That's simply not true. The traffic is requested by the end customer. Despite of the asymmetric traffic flow from content towards eyeballs, the traffic is still requested uh, by the broadband customer. Uh, there is one exception, uh, that's email, but that doesn't count because that's beyond uh, below uh, noise level. The principal calling party pays has been reverted by the incumbents to sending party uh, pays. And uh, the eyeball provided incumbents, they can enforce that due to their technical monopoly. Uh, and I have here this uh, um, uh, drawing uh, that, that graphic was uh, produced a couple of years ago by the company formerly known as uh, Level 3. Um, actual name might change in a few months again, but never mind. So the, the yellow points are, are uh, important because these yellow points are the gatekeepers. So you have the angry guy uh, uh, preventing you to enter the club unless you pay high. And that technical monopoly that allows uh, incumbents to enforce the double-sided payment for broadband customers and from content for at least a de decade and that's simply illegal because it's an abuse of the technical monopoly um, these now these same incumbents they expect additional contribution from content providers um, to to build out uh, ftth infrastructure fiber etc etc so my opinion, the incumbents, they're whining at Mrs. Uh, Vestager, uh, and it's so pathetic because, um, I mean, they really have a miserable life. Not sure whether you can see that, but these are the figures of Deutsche Telekom. And sorry, guys, they make big money, and I don't know why they want their rich neighbor to pay additional to contribute uh, uh, to, to, to their uh, money they make every day. So now, having seen no questions online, we're going to go back to our online presenters. And I would uh, like to ask uh, Frode Sorensen to come up first and uh, give us his point of view since he's been working as an open um, internet working group chair since 2012. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we can hear you well. Welcome. Very good. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I represent the Norwegian regulator, the so-called Norwegian Communications Authority. And um, I expect I'm invited due to my background as uh, chair of the Barrack Net Neutrality Working Group uh, 10 years ago. Um, and as you can see on the title of my presentation, I will uh, try to look into the current discussion uh, based on uh, a paper from Barrack in 2012 uh, developed while I was uh, co-chair of the working group. Uh, I'm one of the authors of, of the document but um, it's also um, a document approved by Barrack so it also represents um, principles uh, that are uh, well understood by, by telecoms regulators. Um, I think that's sufficient about my background and I can uh, skip to the next slide, please. Uh, 
um, uh, since you're controlling the slides. Is it possible for me to, to, to uh, scroll it further? Okay. Yes. Um, as you can see, um, the slide is, is separated into four pieces. It was supposed to be an animation, but anyway, um, regarding the first two bullet points, uh, the main content of the document is a discussion about the charging principle sending party network pays. It's been mentioned by the other panelists already. And the reason for dis discussing is this uh, topic in this paper is um, the similarity between the current discussion about charging on the internet and the traditional charging uh, in telephony networks. Uh, in telephony networks, prices are regulated still, and it has been for, for many years. And the main problem which is remaining regarding telephony regulation uh, is that when you place a call, a telephony call to an end user, you, are, uh, you must uh, pass the telephony provider. The telephony provider thereby has a monopoly of the call and therefore it's a possibility for this provider to raise the charge to a high level to a higher level than what what is the optimum price for the market and um, therefore telephony regulators still regulate the telephony operators and the danger that Barrack saw in 2012 and which might also be the problem this year is that if uh, internet traffic is charged by the receiving network uh, because the, the sending network sends a lot of traffic then there might also this time be a need to regulate the uh, the um, agreement between the sending and receiving party in in, in the network uh, another point that was uh, important to this paper from Barrack, as you can see on the second on the next two bullet points is that there is a dependency between the isp and the content provider because the isp can't sell his access without any content and on the other hand of course also the content will not reach the receiver without a connection so therefore it, it's important also for the isp that the content is distributed over the internet so the content itself is also a value that is important for the isp and related to that uh, as has also been pointed out already in this discussion it's the end user that requests the content and the end user pays for the transfer of the content already so that's uh, in traditional um, the, the traditional way of working of the internet, the, the ISP is receiving his income from his own end users. And finally, in, in this Barrick paper, um, the conclusion is that this model has enabled high level of innovation, growth of internet connectivity, and development of a vast array of content and applications to the ultimate benefit of the end users. Attempt to undermine this could put this benefit at risk. So the goal for, for um, this view, the, the reason for this view from Barrack is that we still need to maintain this innovative pow power of the internet. And, and it's of course mainly due to the small and then the upcoming content providers, application providers, that this is important. This is not to protect the big content providers, uh, of course. The, the main reason for this is to protect the smaller providers. Taking a brief look at 2022, um, things have changed. Um, the traffic is increasing. That's actually nothing new. It has been increasing all the time on the internet. But uh, of course, as we all know, the, the big gatekeepers the big content providers, they have become even bigger for the last 10 years. But this is also the reason for new regulation that is introduced in Europe, like the Digital Markets Act. So steps are taken already to take this into account. Uh, 
Furthermore, related to that, Barakil is also publishing a report on the internet ecosystem in a couple of weeks, which will also discuss the relationship between ISPs and content providers, which might also shed some light on this, uh, this discussion. These principles from, from this paper 10 years ago should still be valid in, in our understanding. And I will afterwards um, leave the rest of the Barrack discussion to, to my colleague Klaus Nieminen, who is the current uh, chair of the working group. Thanks. Thank you very much, Frode. And uh, Klaus, if, uh, if you're online, please uh, take the floor. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. And, and it's my pleasure to be here. I'm Klaus Nieminen, a co-chair co for the Open Internet Working Group and, and, and basically been working with uh, the net neutrality and also with the IP interconnection for around 20 years now. Um, I'm normally working in, in Traficon, that's the Finnish telco regulator, and I'm acting as a chief expert there. Maybe a couple of points first on this this topic. Uh, I think the motivation, of course, sir, uh, and, and the, the one of the ideas what also was presented by Ethno was that we want to see the gigabit society targets to be met. And that, that of course, we all agree that, that we would like to get a good broadband connectivity for everybody in Europe. But the question is that whether there, there is a, a fairness issue around this topic. I think we've been hearing from the commission that, that they, they've been investigating the matter. And I, I think it, it's also mentioned by the commission that, that well, they, they, they would look into the, the question whether there's a fairness issue or not. Uh, from a point of view, I would say that we consider this matter very important. I mean, we are very happy to see how the internet has evolved and, and basically it has been uh, allow the, the, the internet ecosystem to grow and, and also provide innovations. And of course, we would like to see the internet also to continue in that manner. Now, well, just actually agreed because I'm in Dublin uh, in Berek meeting and, and we just agreed that we are um, studying this topic too. If we want to give our contribution for the discussion, but the, 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 well, the discussion is just starting in Berek. But basically, I'm not really going to um, give you any insights on what the outcomes will be, but I can promise that you will hear from us in the near future around this topic. And basically, I would also like to mention that we are seeing that there are actually plenty of different contributions already available. I think the, for example, the WIC consultant uh, study conducted for Bennett Say, the, the German uh, regulator, was very helpful. But also to recap the the, the uh, interconnection ecosystem and, and the, the how it works at the moment. We are seeing that that uh, there's also a contribution for this specific fair share topic. We have seen the contribution from Ethno, but we also received one contribution from ISPs uh, for, uh, regarding this topic for the Open Internet Guidelines and, and that will be published there, um, in June, then we, we published the Open Internet Guidelines, but I would have to say that uh, those ISPs were very critical uh, for that proposal, the Ethno proposal, and, and also seeing that there are potential competition issues if that kind of the proposal would go through. We have, of course, the, 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 uh, the only example from South Korea, and I, I think we're also going to look to that, that use case. And, and, and definitely we, we believe that the end user and in the impacts to the end users and to the competition need to be paid a lot of attention. So basically we believe that that whether the, somebody would make a clear proposal or to implement this this fair share. So we must make sure that that also the these aspects are properly evaluated. And I, I think from my point of view, I, I see that there well. It's not going to be a, a clear cut. I mean, we see also from the industry and from the ISPs that yes, there's a certain ISP supporting this and, and also some other ISPs very much opposing it. So to me, the, the landscape is already quite a split in that manner. And, and maybe to conclude, um, I would say that uh, 
the, the relative fairness is also something I would like to maybe put as a question. Basically, then we talk if there's a fairness issue, what do we mean by the fairness with this regard? I mean, the, the, the big, big uh, telcos were talking about a lot of about the, the traffic asymmetry. But if you think about, for example, the small eyeball ISPs, to me, the traffic is very asymmetric because they have only the customers consuming the content. And basically, it's not really that much asymmetric to the traffic at all. But that was basically maybe um, with my re remark that, that I would like to get the, the good discussion. I would like to see a lot of, uh, let's say, contributions and also this topic to evaluate it from different angles. So, so we would have a, let's say, good contribution also for the political discussion. Thanks. Thank you very much, Klaus. Um, we'll now go back to, uh, before we open up the floor, um, back to the panelists here in person and maybe uh, who would like to make further comments. Mari, do you have the floor? Should you wish to respond to some of the things? Well, um, there were so many comments to be quite honest that I don't know where to, where to start. Um, yeah, maybe maybe on the net neutrality point that uh, Thomas brought up. So because I explicitly said that we have excluded this uh, from 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 the consideration, and um, so I wouldn't want to be dragging it back into the discussion because and and maybe Klaus and uh, uh, Freude can can correct me, but interconnection is outside the net neutrality rules, the open internet rules. Um, um, as as we um, uh, as we speak today, and I may be wrong, but uh, I would be happy to be corrected if 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 that's not the case. So so we don't see it as an issue of net neutrality um, as such, as I already said. Um, so from our point of view, there's no need to let's say revisit that side at this stage. Of course, we are aware that open internet rules are likely to be reviewed, or at least there will be an assessment in the coming year or two. So that's then another um, other, another opportunity to discuss this. And there will be certainly many other stakeholders who will be contributing to that discussion as well. About the points on openness and transparency on discussion, I would just like to also say that this is not the first public event that we're discussing it. We had two events this week in Brussels and also the shady meetings behind the doors. I mean, we've been doing very proactive outreach bilaterally to stakeholders, including EDRI. Um, so um, uh, this is truly an, uh, an issue where we would like to also collect, um, collect inputs. Because also the solution, as you have heard, is, is not very clear. Um, and it's also a very European situation. So the regulatory framework in Europe is quite tight for the telecom operators. And um, tighter than in other parts of the world, so it doesn't leave a lot of room for maneuver to find uh, alternative solutions, if you like. So, well, I don't know if there are further questions on on, on specific points, but um, I would leave that there just to echo Klaus, maybe that you know we have now the very ambitious targets in Europe, the political targets, fiber and 5G to everybody by 2030. And if we want to be serious about these, the current financial state of the European telco sector simply doesn't allow it. And I appreciate that there were some nice numbers uh, being showed, but uh, DT, for example, has a very successful operation in the US that is doing much better, and mainly because of the regulatory differences between the US and, and, and Europe. And hence, for example, it can be argued that 5G deployment in US is much further ahead than in Europe, because of these investment um, issues. And I'm happy to provide numbers if that's of interest, but also I understand that this is not the financial community, so I will perhaps not go there. Thank you. Um, thank you, Merit. I'm sure um, people are taking notes uh, as you speak and uh, uh, waiting for their comments, but we also would like to open this round table to people here in the room. So please, uh, there is a rowing mic here and um, come up to the microphone if you have a specific question uh, to any of the panelists. Um, thank you. Um, anyone uh, wanted to uh, make a point? Thomas, uh, are you? Yeah, just to, to clarify. So such access fees or sending party pays are clearly illegal uh, in the 2010 and 2015 open internet order of the FCC in the United States. Uh, of course, those who have been 
um, scrapped by the Trump administration, but a California and New York net neutrality law would still prohibit this. Similarly, in India, the net neutrality framework would prohibit this, and I point you to paragraph five and six of the Barrack net neutrality guidelines that clearly say that interconnection cannot be used as a circumvention tool for net neutrality protections. And circumvention, I think, is the right approach because it would, in fact, mean that the traffic from certain cups is treated differently in the network, that it would be at a lower quality to the end user, and um, the pricing, of course, is also affected. Interconnection between um, access networks, of course, is out of the current uh, net neutrality framework. We have a case-by-case -case provision there, as you know, in the EECC. Um, and just lastly, because this money aspect, uh, Barra, uh, the ETHNO study is, is quite uh, vague on, on several fronts, but it is very concrete when it is uh, talking about how the money should be used. And you are clearly excluding any taxation model or any fund-based model where we could have a democratic debate how these um, incomes should be used. Uh, so there is only one way that the telecom industry sees here the money should be used for them. Um, and then, then lastly, um, there are studies that can show us that um, in the countries with the highest termination fees, you have the lowest network investment. Um, so with all of this um, pile of evidence, also the uh, aforementioned study from the German telecom regulator on interconnection in particular, that I think is quite recent. Um, I, I think we need to take all the evidence into account when making policy. Thank you, Thomas. I'm going to give the floor to an online um, person first, if you, uh, unless this is a direct response. Um, uh, Patrick um, Tarpy has been waiting to uh, make his question and then, oh, okay, you're here. <laughs> Hello, I'm, I'm in, uh, here in the room. Uh, Patrick Tarpy Ofcom, that's the UK Communications Regulator. Just a couple of observations. Are you not concerned that if this plan were to go ahead, the unintended consequence would be that the smaller operators who don't have such great negotiating power by dint of uh, the amount of eyeballs that they have or the size of their actual uh, you know, user base could be seriously disadvantaged. So you may find an unintended consequence, maybe in the rural or other poorly served areas will be, uh, have further detriment. And secondly, um, earlier today I mentioned the words of oblivious technology and the ubiquity of encryption. And in fact, we see recently the deployment of Apple private relay has actually upended this notion that operators can plainly and clearly see the real destination and source of traffic that's flowing through their access network. So there's, there's two kind of you know, concerns I have immediately. I want to emphasize this is not an official off view, it's me as an individual here. But as I say, it's one about competition size and negotiating power, and the other is the emergence of oblivious type encryption. Uh, thank you, um, Patrick. Would anyone like to uh, make a comment on any of these two? Um, okay. Thank you for I your... I completely concur, and I would like to have answers to those. Uh, I'm not an operator, I'm not an economist, so I clearly don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I think Klaus made a very important point there in the round of discussion about the word fair, because there will be many different interpretations about what's considered fair for an incumbent operator, will be different to what a content provider thinks is fair, or should be different to what an IXP thinks is fair. So we have to be very careful in the use of the lines for these kind of things because these words can mean different things to different people and it depends on the context in which it's being used. So I think an important part of the discussion that has to take place here is to have a common understanding of the terminology. Simply saying this is not fair, well that may be your perception of it, but for another part of the market, this, this particular, any particular style is more than fair, it's more than reasonable. And I think another important thing is we have to bear in mind that in this particular discussion about network neutrality, it's different a little bit from what it was like 10, 20 years ago than the previous discussions had, because the technology and the architecture of the internet has changed. Patrick was mentioned things about the Bluebus technologies and the ubiquitous uptake of encryption technologies. But there's also been some other work happening with actually the delivery of content. Jeff Houston, who does a lot of research on this stuff, they've got some excellent talks, one which I 
people look at is death of transit. And this basic thesis there is that the big content operators have their own global fiber network and they're installing cash flows, so what we want to call them, inside the eyeball networks. So that the eyeball networks are not paying for the transit to get the content, all they're doing is distributing over their own internal network to the end user. So from that point of view, the costs of price are probably next to nil, I don't know. But I'm speculating that's the new will be. And I think that's a huge consideration. So whenever uh, a newcomer operator says 55% or 75% of our traffic is from these big six content providers, and much of that is actually coming into your network and much of that traffic is actually being distributed within your network, and you're not actually paying for the transit to get content from Facebook or YouTube or whatever actually brought into your network. So I think we have to be very careful when we're talking also about traffic levels and traffic patterns, what do we mean by 55% of our traffic comes from these providers? Thanks. Thank you, Jim. You said fear, not fear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I can, I can confirm that. I mean, we were talking about 80%. Uh, up to 80% of the traffic flows in from from uh, from just 10, 10 ASNs these days, and uh, I disagree with the, the uh, comment of Marit that she said uh, it's a challenge for eyeball operators. That's not. It's it's actually easier if you just have to talk to a few to optimize a lot of traffic. And it doesn't cost a lot. I mean, we're just talking here about the, the cost of layer three and a, a typical eyeball. I don't know. I probably would spend uh, one or two euro per subscriber and months for the IP uh, part. And that's almost nothing compared to the total cost of providing a service. And uh, to, to count the agreement, uh, to the, the um, uh, saying that we are not talking net neutrality. I mean, don't we passively not upgrading is actually an aggressive act? And in my opinion, it's a violation of net neutrality. And last but not least, there is no lobby in Brussels for the end users. So what do they expect? They expect uh, a service which is not broken. And what is not broken? Is it just okay that they don't call support? Or is it, do we really want to provide a good service? Do, are we proud enough to, to provide a good internet service to our end customer? And all these games, uh, who is paying whom, etc. that's against um, my standards of, of, of being a, 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 a proud, network engineer to, to, to provide a good service to my end customer. Maybe just an immediate reaction. Okay, yes, it's in, in theory easier to talk to a few companies, but what if they don't want to talk to you because you're too small? What if they do not want to have it? I want they, to have they the talk to me. I yesterday had meeting with, with the guys of Netflix. They bring me new, new cash service. So they talk to me. They want to provide a good service and I help them and we have a, we have a joint yeah a joint interest to provide good service to our end customer. Well, you probably have a privileged relationship there then. Um, um, no, definitely not. No. So maybe just to, maybe just to, um, uh, to, to, to uh, there was a gentleman who was talking about um, the, the, the network level. So we do, of course, understand that there is, uh, that, that the big tech are investing in the global infrastructure, that they are bringing the content um, uh, nearer to, to end customer. And I've been privileged actually to hear Jeff Huston's uh, the is transit debt uh, presentation in a ripe meeting some years ago. And it's, it's uh, very eye opening. So we're here really talking about the network layers from the CDN from the cash to the end user. We're not talking about the, the, the global internet as such from, uh, from our point of view. Sorry, yes, one second. Frederick, Amazon Web Services, one of the big players here. We talk with everyone. Firstly, the floor to Alex and then. If I may add to this, if the um, content provider puts caches within the network of the telco, whatever happens within the network of the telco is covered by net neutrality. So if you say we're going to do stuff with it, we want to get paid extra, etc., um, you're directly interfering with net neutrality. 
it's not like okay it's outside the border it's transit it's coming in it's interconnection well i don't know but maybe we have regulators in line um for for a clear interpretation if anyone wants to make a comment from Klaus or Frode, please. Uh. Well, if I may, basically, well, first of all, um, as, as mentioned already, well, we consider that, that for example, the interconnections are, are something that the NRS may look into because, I mean, the, even the, the commercial practices from ISP cannot circumvent the, the, the end user rights according to the free one and, and also now of course the equal treatment obligation that that covers also the the, the pricing practices and then basically well i would say that there we are not still stepping into the directly regulating the um the interconnections but but they're they are relevant in this context that that would be my answer and then basically we haven't had that kind of the cases i think that many in, in the the past so that that's just now where the 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 traffic I'm hat on because uh, it, it's not really a, a a topic that's been um let's say debated a lot in in, in within Perec at the moment anything would like to uh, add Frode? Uh, yes I, I agree with you Klaus um and then I could also add that uh what is net neutrality that's also a philosophical discussion uh, and it also depends on the jurisdiction so in, in in our case it's it's a question about uh, what does the european open internet regulation say about the question and and um in, in that regard it's it's very clear about the access leg of the service and it's not very explicit about the interconnection leg so it is covered to some extent uh, which uh, thomas referred to uh, but i also uh, agree with marit that it's it's not that obvious how interconnection should be regulated based on net neutrality and that is also the reason why barrack is not referring as explicitly to net neutrality in the 2012 paper it was discussed on, on a more general basis uh, based on for example the question about termination monopoly but that that's the current state um you never know what, what happens to the regulation so of course it, it could uh, change in the future and, and I believe it's also more explicitly covered in, for example, the, the US, the former US regulation and, and the Indian regulation, but not that explicitly in the European regulation as far as I can understand. Thanks. Thank you for both the clarification. We go back to the line and please say your name. And... Uh, partner Maya from LACNIC, uh, speaking by myself. Um, not properly a question, but uh, uh, perspective from our region. Uh, we have a reality totally different from European. And uh, we have nowadays um, 16,000 ISPs, small ISPs. Uh, all those ISPs are deploying fiber, actually J, uh, with the own uh, network, they all fake fiber. At least uh, each small city in Brazil, at least one ISP is present in the city. And um, I think uh, this uh, reality was um, due to a lot of things together. First, our internet governance model that uh, was created in 1995 and, and is present until today. And um, um, a law that's called the Marco Civil, this is a law, uh, important law that uh, respects net, 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 net neutrality. And uh, mainly by the poor interest of the big companies to provide service in the remote locations. Because if you, we are expecting from the big companies to provide, maybe we are in the last century. Okay. Thank you for that um, point of view from Latin America. Well done. Blake Willis, Peering Geek, just speaking for myself. Um, 
The internet has consistently proven itself to not really care too much about national political borders. And we already see this in content markets where, for example, uh, France, where I live, you know, there are certain media companies that have monopolies on certain media properties. And so many streaming companies simply serve traffic into that market from other EU markets, um, thus completely avoiding the French content monopoly on whatever content it is. Um, if in a hypothetical future where the European Union has member states implement a sender pays model, would that not simply shift the interconnection market for European traffic to nearby markets that do not need to do such things, such as the UK? Anyone? <laughs> Anyway, that, that's really more of a question to the uh, organizations uh, in, pushing for this sort of legislation. In it's Switzerland, there are push it out of the or just bunch, bunch of data centers. Yeah. yeah, you can rent space and connection. <laughs> <laughs> does uh, Marit, does Edna have a view on that? Listen, um, so, I mean, uh, there were some comments on the, um, on the Axon paper, um, which is not an Edna paper, it's an Axon paper. And... Um, the, the, the policy options. And I think that it's very clear that the policy chapter, first of all, is very short. So it is not a lengthy policy, policy analysis of the options that should be considered. It is a kind of shallow list of options at this stage. What could be options to address this issue in the wider, not only in the internet interconnection uh, sphere, but in the wider um, policy context in Europe, whereby we have this network investment objectives. So the purpose of this paper was never to conclude and say, listen, this is what we want, or this is what we don't want, et cetera, et cetera. It is to put some options out there for discussion and then to debate uh, what are the potential positive consequences and then the uh, no doubt unintended negative consequences that would be the result of it. So we're not there yet. And also there was a comment about what would be fair and what would not be fair. This is not, we don't see that this is something for us to decide. This is something for the policymakers. As we said, this is a policy issue. It is something for the policymakers to look at as well and to decide, first of all, is there a problem? And then if there is, seems to be a fairness issue, well, what would be fair? So I don't think that, uh, you know, uh, operators would step in and say, well, this or that. Um, similarly, for the policy options, we have a very, very tightly knit regulatory and policy uh, kind of network in, in Europe. So there will be, if there will be any, every time there will be new pieces of pieces of law, there are always consequences. So this should be, of course, very carefully, carefully analyzed. Thank you. Hello, I'm Thorsten Sommer. I'm uh, here at my first RIPE meeting and I'm a bit nervous right now. Um, I speak only for myself, uh, also our bone uh, has sponsored me, me for being here. Uh, I have a big uh, background in politics, so um, after hearing all that discussion right now, it sounds a bit to me it's, um, it's not just about uh, commercial stuff. For me it sounds like uh, controlling a market in first step. Um, it sounds a bit like um, who's deciding who can enter that market after all. And if the big companies can decide this in Europe, if a small company can enter the market, if they can afford it, um, maybe then those big companies only stay by themselves. And that's just the first step, because who owns these big companies in Europe? The big telcos, or most of them are owned by governments by states in Europe, the biggest, for example, the Telekom Deutsche. Um, so what's the second step in that? Um, if you control the market and have every control of, of all that stuff, what would be the second step to control the content? So um, this discussion is not just about who's entering the market and stuff. It's just the first step discussion, just for me. So um, maybe what's your, I would like to, to hear what's your thought of, of that statement. Thank you. If 
Anyone is thinking whether well, content well, is controlled? I, I have an way. opinion on that. <laughs> um, the, the point is, if you look at from the client's perspective, who is the client of an incumbent? Is it the customer, the broadband customer, or is it the shareholder? And I believe it's the shareholder. And this whole discussion is only about how incumbents can uh, protect their revenue streams for the shareholder. That's the only point. And it's not about broadband. It's just that, that that's the horse we're riding on, but it's only about the profit of the incumbents. Thank you. We're getting um, close to the end of time, but we can still um, extend for one more question. If there is one question, burning one uh, online, we don't have any, um, and nor in the audience. But I think it would be really nice to hear from everyone uh, who's uh, here. Um, what do they think is the next step going forward? Because there seem to be some kind of exclusion in the regulation where the interconnect charges are part of net neutrality and whether that's part of a broader and and what would these experts and regulators suggest where does technical community go and and participate further in this discussion um, so um, we can start uh, from maybe people online um, uh, maybe first Frode and then Klaus and then go from Fred back to Marit if I may well, basically, as I said already in the beginning, uh, my understanding is that the Commission is at the moment studying the topic and, and we might get then something out of them. So basically, we are not, of course, sure what the Commission potential proposal would be. And, and basically, as I also mentioned, that, that as a BEREC, we, we also like to contribute to that discussion and, and, and basically I think we would be getting some some publications uh, in the near future but but basically yes uh, the, the next steps are still a bit unsure to me uh, on two different levels of course what the time scale would be so the, the when we would have uh, any concrete proposals if, if we are going to have them and, and secondly also I mean what will be proposed and, and what kind of the tools would be then used to implement them so basically I think we are in a very early phase of this discussion and, and, and as far as I understand it well there's not that much to, to conclude yet thank you Friday, if you'd like to um, um, go next, if you're still with us. I agree with Klaus that um, we we still don't know exactly what should be the next step related to net neutrality. I think we have to study the current situation uh, in, in detail. Uh, after all, it's 10 years ago since the previous statement from Barak related to this specific topic. Uh, but uh, Furthermore, we also have the net neutrality regulation, which was not present in, in 2012. So this, this is, of course, an opportunity to see the two things in, in, in connection with each other. And I think it's, it's also relevant to refer to other BAREC activities related to the Internet ecosystem. BAREC is currently um, studying these topics uh, on a general level. And uh, as I mentioned previously, we will launch a report for public consultation in the middle of June. And there is also upcoming work streams for the next year related to uh, other aspects of the internet, uh, not only net neutrality, but to look into the internet ecosystem at, at a more general, with a more general approach. Thanks. Um, our request that the Swiss regulator to, uh, to regulate the IP interconnection on a cost-oriented basis is now pending for nine years. Uh, I hope uh, it won't go another nine years until we have a result. Uh, we have proven with a study of WIC, uh, some of you might know this uh, institute WIC, uh, that the cost, the true cost of interconnection is zero. 
um, uh, so zero settlement peering would be the result and uh, we want that regulated uh, and I don't know how much impact it would have to the European market if the Swiss regulate this but uh, certainly it would be attractive uh, for content to host the content then in Switzerland and push to to Europe then so as we are in the middle of Europe but not part of Europe. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, I'm very happy that we have this debate today here and I think it should be a starting point because right now I can only tell you that what happens in Brussels is quite isolated from arguments and it really requires the insight of practi practitioners like you here in the room um, to inform politicians. Um, Commissioner Thierry Petton announced uh, that he, the Commission will move on this probably with binding legislation later this year. Um, of course, this could be postponed, it could be the next term, we have to review of the net neutrality framework coming up next year, but this danger is real. If you believe it's too stupid and politicians would never do this, I refer to the next session on chat control on the direct attack on end-to-end -end encryption. Um, we have to acknowledge the reality that arguments that seem very simple to us are not common sense somewhere else. And so this transfer of knowledge, this making our own voices and our expertise heard in the Brussels community is the big task that lies ahead of us all if we want to prevent this. And um, here wearing my uh, Adri board hat for European digital rights, uh, we'd be very happy as civil society to also engage with RIPE with other communities to make the politicians understand what the true consequence of such proposals would be. And that's also why I'm here and I am very easy to talk to. I'm also very easy to find online and I hope we can take it from here. Thank you. Yeah, I fully, uh, fully agree. Um, Etno has been working behind the curtains. This popped up a week ago. Uh, it means that we can't wait. Uh, there are a lot of people here in the room. Uh, hopefully you care. Uh, maybe we can do something with RIPE, maybe you're a member of a local association, so please see what you can do. Um, in the end of the year, most likely, uh, Breton um, will want to have something to show. Uh, it most likely will not be good for uh, what we consider the internet. So if you feel that this is a real threat, you have resources, um, make sure you go to Brussels and you pitch the SME, small, medium sized enterprises angle. That's what Brussels really likes to support. Innovation, that's something they would like to support. Uh, don't tell them that you're American big tech. Uh, they really don't like you. Uh, you have your own lobbyist in Brussels. Uh, you will do the fight also, uh, but please try to find some coalition. Uh, we're here, we're willing to help. Thank you. Um, so, I, my understanding is very much the same as uh, that of, um, of, of Klaus, uh, so the European Commission has publicly said that they are working on it, they're looking for data, um, I'm not sure if it will be studies or other things, but uh, like yourselves, we are also waiting for further feedback from that side and uh, expecting, I guess, that there will be further discussions on this topic in the coming months. Thank you very much. And uh, with that, before uh, Chris, you have something burning to Sorry, say. I know, I know we're running low on time. I wanted to say first, thank you all for the speakers who've been here. I know it was a very big panel, and I think it was really Hi. valuable. Sorry, Chris Buckridge, Ripe and CC. It was a very big panel, but it's really valuable to have all those different um, perspectives. And thank you, Desiree, for moderating that. And that's obviously a challenge too. I also particularly just wanted to say thank you for Mara for stepping into the lion's den in this way. I think, yeah, yeah it, it would have been a much poorer discussion without the Etmo perception. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. And uh, thanks for all the attention. I'm just also doing my job. So thanks. <laughs> Uh, so we'll big applause to all our panelists. I'll pass it back to you for our next speaker online. Thank you all. And a big round of applause. Thank you.